like, oh, there's an opportunity here. Big market, check. Big problem, check. Did you have any mentor or guide at that stage? You need to have someone to, you know, cry with on weekends and someone to just have beers with when things are great. You just need to have someone. How much money did you put in the company? Crazy friends put in 10,000, 50,000, some others 2,000, 5,000, whatever. You know, at the beginning, you gotta make it work. You had to make that psychological switch of, uh-oh, if this doesn't work, then my friends aren't in this. How do you deal with all this like rejection when it comes to fundraising? We're not gonna put the money if you don't get the license. And the FCA was like, oh, hold on. We can't give you the license if you don't have the money. Hi again, Alex here and you're watching Founders Hack, a YouTube channel where we interview entrepreneurs to learn from and get inspired by their stories. There is no better way to learn about an industry than by talking to the founders who run successful companies in the sector. Today we will be talking about fintech and I'm super excited to chat with Martin Magnone, the co-founder and CEO of a startup called Timeit, which is the first installment only credit card provider. Martin started the company just four years ago, but has managed to grow it to more than 80 employees, hundreds of thousands of customers, and has raised more than $20 million in seed funding. Watch the interview until the very end. There is a surprise freebie waiting for you there. I hope you enjoy the chat. And if you do, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel. This is the only way for us to keep producing the good content for you on YouTube. So I'm really counting on you. Martin, welcome to Founders Hack. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Let's start with your background. As far as, as far as I understand, you have a background in management consulting. Tell us more about what you did before actually you founded Timeit. Yeah, that's exactly right. I used to work at um, one of the top management consulting firms, Bain & Company, mostly out of the New York office. So I spent about 10 and a half years with them working with banks, uh, sort of credit card issuers and, and, and big, big banks you know, um, and doing the things that consultants do, you know, mm -hmm. strategy, uh, customer work, you know, Bain is really big on, on customer. They, they're the guys who invented net promoter score and they make a big deal about mm -hmm. it. So you kind of tend to do a lot of work with, with the customer and that gets translated into businesses, practices and products and, and all that stuff. So we, I was doing that for a long time, you know, in, 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 that, in that space. Cool. But even before Bain, as far as I understand, you already had your first entrepreneurial experience. Yeah. What was that about and how did it go for you? Yeah, no, it was great. It was, so that was my first and only job before I actually went to business school mm -hmm. and then you know, I moved to consulting after. Um, my brother and I, we started a software business. So we developed customized software applications for businesses like accounting systems, ERP systems, you know, that, that kind of stuff. You know, we had a very small portfolio of clients, you know, three, four clients that we dedicate ourselves to. Um, but we developed custom products and I kind of spend my time, I would say half and half between coding all day oh, and then okay. um, visiting clients and understanding their needs. It was actually a really, really rewarding job because, you know, I would go in the morning to meet one client and they would tell me about, you know, how difficult this task would be. And then in the afternoon, I would go back to the office and start coding. You know, in a couple of days, I would have a solution. I would that go back great. to the client, implement it, and they would be like, wow, you know, you just saved me, you know, an hour a day, you know, things like that. So you, you also have a technical background, yeah. if you can code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what did, did you study as your undergrad? I, I studied uh, computer science and economics. Okay. So I did two degrees. Um, I studied computer science, realized I didn't want to build my life around it, loved mm -hmm. coding. Um, I really liked to build solutions, but it kind of felt that I wanted to be on the side of people making decisions and figuring out what the specs need to be more than just mm -hmm. going and doing it. So I said, I'm going to do something in business. Cool. And then to so the startup that you had, was it in the US or? No, where no, no. Was no. It? So I was born and raised in Uruguay, in South America. So we did that there. Awesome. I ended up, um, yeah, so doing that for five years before. Mm -hmm. Um, we actually sold our products to our main client, and then I went to the U.S. to do my MBA. Okay, sounds amazing. So you basically had your first exit uh, already <laughs> back then? If you can call it then. It was a small exit. Um, it's how, kind of, how much money did you make? No, we didn't make any money, really. Okay. It was just a, a, we, the employees that we had, we transferred to mm -hmm. the company. I made a small amount. Uh, it wasn't big, but this client, which was the biggest one, were 
very much relying on the softwares we build and they needed um, they needed to keep going. Mm -hmm. And my brother had moved into another job. I wanted to go and see the world, go to a May MBA. So my mind was somewhere somewhere else already. So for us, it was a way to actually do things right, leave the capabilities with the client, and just yeah, have some pocket money that I can go and, and use for my next step. But it wasn't a huge exit or anything like that. But it's a start. It's a good story. So then moving on to Bain. Uh, you sp did you mention you spent 10 years? 10 and a half. 10 and a half years with them. So why did you decide to leave and how did that happen? Well, it was, it was a long process. Um, I, I kind of went into Bain thinking that it would be the perfect place for me to come up with a new business idea to do on my own. Mm -hmm. So um, my brother and I kept talking over the years and you always had the dream of, you know, one day we'll go back and we'll start something. So I, I went into Bain thinking, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to go and experience a bunch of businesses. I'm going to learn about a lot of problems and tools to solve them. And, and I'm going to have a lot of great ideas. Yeah. And I'm just going to stay maybe two or three years and go and start my business. Um, that ended up being 10 and a half because, uh, you know, consulting, it's a, it's, it's a great place in the sense that you tend to learn a lot. You get immersed in very strong cultures where um, you get to experience a lot, you get promotions every time, you know, there's like these carrots that you go and it's very easy to get caught up into that. Um, and, you know, it keeps, you know, you keep raising the bar for how good the idea needs to be mm. for me to quit my job, you know. Oh, it needs to be excellent. I looked at, I remember back in 2009, 2010, um, I looked at doing what Mint was doing in the US, doing it in Europe, um, and I looked at some other things and, and no idea seemed good enough um, and until I found one that really did. Did you test these ideas that you that yeah. would come along the way? Yeah, um, yeah, so I would test them. So the first test is, am I passionate enough about this? Mm -hmm. you know, is this a, a problem that I see myself solving? Um, and then second, I would, early on, I would just run, you know, do what a consultant would do, run the numbers and, and, and try to understand what's the gamble you're taking, right? Exactly. So what's really the thing that so what is the you're payout? betting on? Yeah. What's, what's the bet that you're making? And, and, and then I saw that that's, you, you, you can't do that. Like if you put numbers and business plans against that, it just never works out. It's just, it's just the, the leap is too big, you know? Uh, you got to find conviction somewhere else. You're not going to find it in the numbers, at least not most of the time, unless you're into something really, really there is, unique. That is a really good thought. So where did you find the conviction? So it was one day um, um, I was working for, it's actually the number one credit card issuer in the world, mm -hmm. a big, large bank in the US. They also owned one of the largest personal loan businesses in the US. And they hired us to um, help them with the strategy of that personal loan business. So it's a branch it was a branch based business. People walked into branches to get personal loans, like, you know, a thousand dollars to buy something, to go on a trip. And um, we started speaking to customers and looking at the data and we found that most of these people had credit cards in their pocket and with available credit lines and they were still walking into branches to get a loan at a thirty percent APR or twenty five percent APR. Not too different from what you know a credit card in the US would charge you. We're like, why are, are you not using the credit card? And we started um, speaking to customers. We uh, had the luxury of having big budgets to go and do sort of large scale um, sort of research in you know, focus yeah. groups and all that. And we found that it was a matter of control. So people will tell us, well, I'd rather go into a branch, fill out a form and get a loan because I know exactly what I'm getting into. I know I can get out of the loan by paying this much every month. I know I'm going to get uh, charged X in interest. I feel much better doing that than actually putting it on my credit card that A, I don't know how much it's going to cost me, B, it's not going to help me give me a plan to play it back, and C, I'm sure the bank is going to screw me some way along the way. So I'd rather just do that. And and when I saw that, I guess something kicked in inside. Like, some sort of, yeah, some sort of, sort of hormonal response was kind of like, oh, there's an opportunity here. <laughs> because, you know, kind of I started seeing like huge market check, big problem check. Um, I also, the, the third one was, you know, we, we, so these credit card issuers were our clients, right? They were coming to me and my colleagues asking us, how do we grow the cards business? How do we make more lending? Because we only make money when people borrow on credit cards. We don't make money if people pay in full. And so we were already working on how do we improve the product? 
So I came back to the banks and we came back to the banks and we said, guys, if we want to grow the business, we want to improve the product, we need to give people control. Mm -hmm. We actually need to make people feel smart because otherwise it's not going to work. And the banks were attracted to the idea, but there was no way they could do it because the, just the tech wasn't there. It's so, so hard. You, I had no idea. It's so hard to make changes. Even smallest, the smallest change you have to do at a large bank into a system that affects the servicing model, you have to touch tens of systems, you have to change so many processes. It's, it's just nearly impossible. And if you're talking about a dramatic shift into how the product works, it's just, it's just too hard. So the, the, the final tick was, oh, banks cannot do this. It wasn't just one, you know, we, we, we spoke to many of them because we actually even pitched it as a way of let's build it together, we can help you, etc. And everybody loved the idea, but it's just they don't have the capability to do it. So big market, check. Big problem, real problem that people are struggling with, check. And then third, competitors cannot do it. So that gave me, I guess, the, um, the confidence, the excitement, the motivation to actually you know, go that mental, so the next mental step of saying, okay, this could be real. You know, this could be, this could be my next stage in my life. That is super interesting. Did you have any, let's say, mentor or guide at that stage mm. to actually give you this confidence to, to act on it? <laughs> well, you know, when you're at, um, at a firm like Bain, you have lots of mentors, mm -hmm. really smart people that are there to help you. And um, so you have a support group that it's there for you. But it, it's not the kind of help that, that you would you need for something like this you know people from these sorts of establishments would see these things as a bit too risky and they just cannot digest the risk right it doesn't seem like yeah. a great idea to them i mean it's more like oh yeah if it's exciting to you then you just go and do it yeah you know, right but you know you don't you don't get really great advice i i got better better advice from people who actually done this so Friends of mine from business school who you know, started businesses. Um, I think that's where I got the most help from. I, I couldn't call out a mentor per se, but yeah, I did have you know, a handful of friends that have done this. And what did they say? Me. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so probably the, the best advice I got was um, a big friend of mine, a good friend of mine that said, look, um, Martin, like, if, if you're going to do this, there's two things that you that you need to do. First, you need to determine that you're willing to do this. And, and second, you need to make sure that you're able to do this. Um, so willing is, this is going to be hard. You know, you're going to suffer. Um, it's not going to be easy. So you got to really, really make sure that you're willing to do this. You got to talk to your partner. Back then, you know, yeah. I, I just become married. And talk to, he said, talk to your, talk to your wife. And this is a journey that you go on it together because it's going to be with you on weekends. It's going to be on evenings. It's not a nine to five job. So, so you got to realize that, yep, yeah, I'm willing to do that. And then second, as importantly, you got to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. So in order to be able to do it, you have to have so a couple of things. Um, and, and again, this is something that worked for me, may not apply mm -hmm. to everybody else, but um, you have to have the ability of sustaining yourself financially for at least a year. At least yeah. a year, and whatever it takes. You know, if you got to go live with your parents, or if you have savings, great. You know, got your budget. You know, I, I used to live the life of a you know high-paid job in New York, and you you don't want to see my monthly bills. It was crazy, so we had to cut back, uh, and, and on that. And fortunately, I did have some savings I could use, but one year. So assume one year at least of mm -hmm. no salary. Um, that's the advice I got that I found really helpful, and then. Second is also you need to have on top of that some money set aside to invest in the company. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, depending on the type of company you are building, but 20k, 30k, 50k, you know, along those lines, you gotta, you got you just gotta put in some because you'll need some some of that flexibility before you can start to convince some other people also um, that that you know to come in. You gotta have some some sort of cushion there. I think that that's is that is a great story and an amazing advice really really good one um okay so your situation as far as instant was also a little bit trickier because you had to move countries yeah. to do this so you were based in the us and the idea so first of all why did you choose Lond london 
So a couple of things. So on the, I would say on the professional side, um, my brother co-founder Nico was already living in London. Mm -hmm. So he was working for a big bank in London and in credit cards, so in the same space. And we spoke about which market made more sense for us to start in, whether that would be the US or, or here in London. And at the time, there were two things that made us tilt the balance to London. Uh, one was that um, we felt that the whole scheme of rewards around a credit card added a lot of noise to the proposition. So in the US, you have high interchange fees, you know, commissions paid by merchants through the network that are high, which they, you know, banks use them to fund very, I would say, juicy rewards programs. So you get a lot of points in the US, you know, cash back and all of that. Mm -hmm. And, and that just gets the proposition of budgeting with a credit card and a good lending proposition, which is what we wanted to focus on, just, it just distorts the message. It just, mm -hmm. It's harder to get cut through. Um, in the UK, you still have a very well-developed credit card market, lots of underserved people budgeting with credit cards with a horrible experience, not a lot of rewards out there. So we felt that the messaging w could be easily, more easily targeted into the credit element. Uh, and then second is that the, the regulator, the FCA in the UK, well, I mean, you already had, so this was 2016. Mm -hmm. So Monzo and Revolut were already starting to take off. The FinTech revolution had already started. Uh, people were actually banking on mobile. Open banking was a big Open part. banking was coming. Um, the FCA, actually, we knew that was a big uh, thing, um, hurdle for us, because it's a regulated industry. You cannot operate without permissions. I didn't see ourselves as a startup with no money getting approved in the US to do mm -hmm. a new form of lending. And we were transforming how lending works on a credit card, changing the lending model. So we felt that the the FCA was gonna be a bit more open, a lot more open really. With a sandbox program, I got in touch with them. They were very open. We had initial conversations so that. That's but what, we, made us. what is sandbox program for people yeah, who, who so, don't so, know about it? Yeah, so the FCA, I think they still have this program where if you come up with a product that um, is not, I would say, readily approved for you know for being live, you, you can go into this program where they would allow you to go live with a select number of users, okay. observe you for a while, maybe six months, 12 months, see what a consumer, the impact of the consumer is, and then determine the right way to regulate you, and then you come out of that program with you know sort of a clear indications on how to go and, and operate the business and remember you know we were switching a revolving model on a credit card into an installment based model to give people more control you know the that's the intention give people more transparency and control but we're still changing the rules of how the product works and um, so we needed a regulator that was open to to actually kind of have the conversation with us okay that's really good talking about your co-founder your brother. By the way, is he your um, youngest brother, oldest brother? Older. Older, Older brother. but then you are the CEO of the company. Yeah. Uh, how does that dynamic work? Uh, well, I mean, we don't... It's not that we have built a hierarchy between us. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that I come from more of the business world, more of a... I come I with more sort of a product side of things, a little bit of marketing, um, more strategy, and he comes from a pure tech mm -hmm. and ops background. So he would be reporting to COOs of big banks and implementing and developing huge credit card systems and payment systems. So we kind of split ourselves that way. You know, we would handle technology, compliance, operations, and I would get more into the fundraising, marketing product. Um, then we have more people join in after we started. We had another co-founder that um, used to be an INSEAD and had worked at McKinsey in the past, and he's our risk officer, Juan. And then we had Roku come in, used to be a London Business School, and then he joined us as our CFO later on. Okay, perfect. And doing business with your family, like having your brother as a co-founder, um, can you like tell us a little bit more about like what are the pros and cons? <laughs> Yeah. Do you have any examples where yeah. it kind of really helped and when it was not helpful? Yeah, I get, you know, I get that question a lot. It really, <laughs> um, I, I think it's, for me, it was been a very positive experience. Mm -hmm. And so here's the thing, you, you, when you start a company that needs a lot of capital, that needs to grow fast, that is a regulated business, whatever it is, it, it's a roller coaster. You're going to have 
amazing days and you're going to have the most you know, trashing days, very ups and downs. You need to have someone that can walk that path with you, someone to you know, cry with on weekends and someone to just have beers with when things are great. You just need to have someone. Um, I think a family member makes a great co-founder, really. Um, I might be biased, but I think um, I wouldn't have been able to do this with, with, without, without him, the emotional support, the unconditional support that you get from a family member. Um, we have very transparent conversations. There's no hidden agendas. You know, the, it's a tricky thing because, you know, when you get into this, you know, the, so your startup becomes your life, right? Your, your security, your financial security of yourself, of your family, if you have one, mm -hmm. depends on it. So it's very easy to have your own agendas when you're making decisions. So when you're dealing with a family member, Oh, it's very transparent, uh, so you know, you know, I know he's got my back. He knows yeah. I got his. Uh, there's no no secrets, no, nothing going on. Um, so if you can have that kind of relationship with a non-family member, great. It's doable. Um, it's you know, people do it all the time, but I found it you know very natural to do it with my brother. Great. What about the other co-founders? How did you meet them, and how long did you know each other before you actually started working on Time It? Yeah, so we met actually from a friend, mm -hmm. um, an introduction. I met Juan in London um, from a friend of a friend that he was interested in fintech. He had, um, I really liked his background, really smart guy. Um, we just went in for lunch and we started talking about it. Then he joined part time for a while, mm -hmm. we just tried to see how it was like to work together um, and then kind of see what happens. And it worked out really well. So it's kind of, it just just happened, really. We didn't. I didn't look for it. It just it just happened to happen. So you had your co-founders. You had the idea. Mm. How did you go about building the first version of the product, so a minimum viable product, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For us, that was a tricky one because you know we couldn't get a single live account out there without mm. the full provision of the SCI, mm -hmm. and that was the first hurdle. Uh, so we, in the way we envisioned our products um, is. You know, we want to make sure that we make the customer feel smart and in control. So we had to um, do essentially three things. We had to build the, the minimum tech to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't anything in the market out there. You can find revolving credit card platforms, but if you wanted to actually bring installments as a way to budget more effectively, you had to build the tech to do it. Number two is getting the permissions to do it. Um, you know, I guess maybe because of our personalities, we. You know, we're less of a sort of a of someone who would just go out and do something they're not supposed to. You know, we we wanted to do it the right way, so we went very upfront with FCA. This is what we want to do. Um, what do we need to get done in order to do it mm -hmm. properly? Um, and we went that way. It took us a year to to get the right permissions to be able to launch the product. And then thirdly, we need to get funding, right? Um, and and this is the thing in fintech. You know, the concept of an MVP is relative. You know, it's like you're not, you know, it's a regulated industry and, and you gotta make sure that whatever thing you put out there meets the minimum standards. Mm -hmm. So you need a little bit of capital, you know, for, for, for that. Um, so we had to line up those three things to get it to get it started. It took us a couple of years before we could actually get a single card out there. And maybe talking about the product itself a little bit. So what was the first version of the product? Yeah. So the first version was actually, you know, dumb mock-ups. And mm -hmm. um, I even started doing focus groups and interviews in New York. Actually, even before I left Bain, I was, you know, the moment I decided I wanted to do this, you know, I was just working on weekends and yeah. and and also you know, over the week on just uh, building prototypes and speaking to people, showing it to people, getting feedback. Um, then when we moved to the UK, we sort of put together the initial um, cash and we hired some developers to be able to build the next version of a, of a mock-up. So something we could run on a mobile, give it to people, see how they would use it. Um, so to kind of um, something that reflected the experience as we saw it and more in, in, in real terms. So that was the next thing that, that, we, that, we, that we did. And just for, uh, for the background purposes for the viewers, so basically your first product was an installment based credit card right right exactly so w instead of you buying with a traditional credit card and then being asked how much of that you want to pay back 
mm -hmm. at the end of the month, we would want to give control to people on how they would want to pay back each purchase. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to pay it in full at the end of the month, great, for free, fantastic. Or you can take any purchase individually and put it on a payment plan. Um, sometimes interest free, we give out three months for free. So you could always do split a purchase in three months with, uh, with no cost. And if you need more time, you can put it in longer installments and always know upfront what the cost is going to be and you have a plan to repay it. So we had to make the product in a way that people knew the functionality was readily available. So when they took our card, um, they can actually access those installments at any merchant in the world um, instantly with their, with their mobile. And that's the thing that we wanted to test. So when the product had to go live, it had to do that in this minimum fashion, but it had to do, it had to do that. I see, I see. Okay, very useful. And then you mentioned that as a first step, you had to fund the company yourself from mm -hmm. your own savings. Yeah. So how much money did you put it uh, in the company at the beginning and how long did you bootstrap it for? I think I put something like 40,000 mm pounds -hmm. or something like that um, at the beginning. Um, I was fortunate that you know I had friends that was, were willing to actually invest some money at the beginning. So, um, it, so even at the of, idea stage, yeah. Okay, that's very yeah. Good. I think I mean that's the easiest first step, right? Mm -hmm. You go to the people you know that trust you, mm -hmm. that you tell them your vision, um, and if they think it's exciting enough, they may chip in some cash. Mm -hmm. You know, some you know, crazy friends put in ten thousand, fifty thousand, some others two thousand, five thousand, whatever. You know, at the beginning, you got to make it work. Mm -hmm. It's all about making it work, uh, and that's what you do at the very initial stage. Um, it's not an easy one because you had to make that psychological switch of, uh oh, if this doesn't work, I'm, I'm gonna, actually my friends are in this. So th that's sort of your leap there. I, I felt that that was, for me, this was a before and after. It's very different to just toy around with somebody else's money that, you know, someone mm -hmm. fun that, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work out. But if it's your friends or your family, you know, you, you get a sense of responsibility. Um, so this either has to work or I gotta give it all. Like they, they gotta know that, and this is what I told my friends. I told, you know, I don't know if this is gonna work or not, but I'm, you know, I can guarantee you that I'm just gonna give it all. I'm just gonna try really, really hard. Um, and that worked. I mean, we were able to, uh, between my brother and I, we were able to raise the initial cash uh, that, you know, we could build the very initial prototypes mm -hmm. and then have the right conversations with the FCA and then with institutional investors who started to chip in some money. Uh, Was it like a year them. later? Yeah. Wait, okay. Yeah, it was about a year later. Um, we got caught up into this kind of catch-22 where yeah. there was a point where um, just really at the end of, we were about to launch and we had this, we put up our seed round. The seed round was ready, but the investor, the lead institutional investor was like, well, we're not gonna put the money if you don't get the license. Um, and the FCA was like, oh, hold on. We can't give you the license if you don't have the money because you're not gonna be able to operate the business. We have to see the cash in the bank. And so we had to work something out. So at the end of the day, and this is you know, coming back to the point of the FCA being open, really mm -hmm. uh, prone to helping startups. And they gave us sort of a permission to operate the business, say, you know, you can do more than X thousand customers, right? And we will allow you to launch with, you know, whatever cash you have in the bank. And then if you want to unlock the, 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 you know, the ability mm -hmm. to do more than that, and so we were able to, to, to convince everybody to do that, and, and we did it. We did it that way. Okay, that, that's a great story. Raising this uh, first round from the institutional investors, it's like a, a whole separate job, probably like fundraising. Oh yeah. In and of itself. Oh yeah. Uh, how did you go about it? Like, I don't know if you had already some content top contacts in the VC world, mm. and if not, so what is the first step for for a first time founder to to try and do it. Yeah, well, it, it's a numbers game, right? There's tons and tons of uh, funds out there. You can get lost in the, in sort of in the, in the space. Mm -hmm. there, there's more than you can speak to. Um, I, and, and it's also, it takes a lot for an institutional investor to actually firm up plans to invest. Like it needs to fit their strategy, it needs to feel right, they need to be at the right stage, you know, a lot of ducks need to be lined up. To, so it's a numbers game. You got to set yourself up for having 
tons of conversations, mm -hmm. getting ready for tons of them not to work until you find the ones that actually you have a better fit and they work. So that's why you have to have enough time um, to be able to, to do that, sort of runway they call it, so you gotta be able to keep things going until you find the right, the right partner, or so you don't wanna rush it, although you always have to rush it in the end, um, but it, it takes a lot of work, a lot of conversations. I did not have contacts in the VC world. I, I don't think you need them. I mean, if you have them, they will help you for sure. But it's not a requirement. I just think. Do I mean, you just reach out to them? Yeah, on I mean, the, the LinkedIn call, call. I don't know. Well, I mean, you, you, you yeah. I mean, you, you got to surround yourself with people that in that are connected. Mm -hmm. So you can start with angels, for example. So we spoke to a bunch of angels that invested in fintech companies. They themselves were LPs of funds, or they were they knew funds mm -hmm. very well. So they would start and then introduce you to other funds. Then funds introduce you to other funds, and um, and then you know all of a sudden you do get access to to, to lots of them. For us, it, we didn't have really any problems in, in opening up conversations. I guess you know fintech has always been, and, and credit you know very hot space, and uh, funds were keen to. Um, speak to you to understand what was going on. Just remember that as a founder, you know you you always also have the the information of what's going on. That funds mm -hmm. want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. They want to understand what's going on. Um, what are you up to? How how do you deal with all this like rejections? Let's say when it comes to fundraising. Oh, I mean you have to accept that it's part of the process, mm -hmm. right? You have to um, mentally you have to just take it as. You know, you have to get a bunch of nows to get a yes. So don't take it personally. Just um, you know, the the take whatever feedback you can. Um, the f feedback is not always crystal clear, mm -hmm. uh, but there's bits and you know pieces there that you can take. So don't don't think too much about it. Just keep going. Uh, just you know, pick yourself up and, and and go to the next conversation. And you know, as many things in life, once you do them over and over, you, you'll get used to it. Like you know. A, I used to you know, hear stories about you know one of the hardest things are when you meet an investor they tell you you know New York company really is not that great we're not going to invest and then you know in half an hour you have another meeting with another investor and you need to tell them how great your company is and and I'm like oh that's that's got to be really hard but then you know, after you do it three or four times <laughs> you just you know you, you just remove all the anxiety the emotions and, um, and if you have conviction of what you're doing um, just you know focus on the positives. Um, have a good story for the negatives. There's always negatives. Yeah. There's there's no perfect business. Um, craft your story well. Uh, throw emotions. Throw your vision out there. Leave it all out there. Um, just uh, do do that, and just you have to have faith that it's going to work out in the end.